Michael Burry rose to fame as an investor through his short of the US housing market in 2008 and 2009, which of course was depicted in the movie The Big Short, where Michael Burry was portrayed by Christian Bale. Recently I stumbled across some of Michael Burry's early letters to investors from the fund that he ran in the early 2000s, Scion Value Fund. And having read those letters, I still believe that there's a lot in there that applies to investing today and there's information and lessons that can be useful even to the everyday individual investor. This video is going to be part two in this two part series, pulling apart some of the lessons from Michael Burry's early letters to investors. If you haven't checked out part one in the series already, uh, I will leave that linked up in one of the corners here so that you can go and check out that video. If you enjoy this video and would like to see future content and haven't subscribed to the Investing with Tom channel just yet, be sure to subscribe to the channel and that way you can catch future content. But for now, let's get straight into some of these lessons from Michael Burry. Now there are a few things in these letters that Michael Burry was extremely consistent on and often would reinforce to investors quarter after quarter after quarter in his letters. And one of those things was really maintaining a very long term focus with his investment strategy. Now Michael Burry, particularly in these early years of running his fund, was a classic value investor. He subscribed to sort of the Joel Greenblatt approach that if you do good valuation work on individuals companies, eventually the market will agree with you. In the short term the market is a voting machine and in the long term the market is a weighing machine so Michael Burry thought that if he could do good valuation work and buy companies at a substantial discount to what he believed their true intrinsic value to be that eventually the market price would move up to intrinsic value. He just really didn't know whether that re-rate up to intrinsic value would happen in a week, a month, a year or maybe even three or five years and that is why he really wanted to have a group of investors on board that agreed with the framework and were willing to wait potentially a few years to see a genuine outperformance come out of Michael Burry's fund. So these are a few things that Burry said throughout his letters uh, on that topic of having a long-term approach. Over periods greater than five years, you should rightfully expect the fund to beat the S&P 500 handily, but in these first two months, the fund certainly overreached. I trust that you will not hold me to the standard every two months henceforth. That was from the very first letter Michael Burry ever wrote in his fund after um, a good start but a very short period of time he kind of came out the gate really well and was outperforming the market but he obviously didn't want investors to bank on that happening every single quarter. In his next quarterly letter he said I fully expect and recommend that members of this investment vehicle judge my performance over a period of five years or greater not five months or less. This will prove the most fruitful and enjoyable manner in which to participate in the fund. The very next quarter, after another period of quite strong returns, still in the early days for the fund, he said, uh, Yet I must emphasize once again that while the fund may yield surprising results over short time frames, this phenomenon neither concerns me when the results seem cause for lament, nor lifts me when the results seem cause for celebration. I urge the same reactions in you. I fully expect and recommend that members of this investment vehicle judge my performance over a period of five years or greater. This will prove the most fruitful and enjoyable manner in which to participate in the fund. The very next quarter, Michael Burry again said, I fully expect and recommend that members of this investment vehicle judge my performance over a period of five years or greater. This will prove the most fruitful and enjoyable manner in which to participate in the fund. And Michael Burry really just repeated this message over and over again in kind of all his quarterly letters. Uh, sometimes he said it in the exact same words like he did in those couple of examples, and sometimes he said it slightly differently. In the next quarterly letter, he said, over the longer term, however, I continue to recommend evaluation periods in excess of five years and in no circumstances less than three years. I expect the fund will show decent outperformance relative to most widely used benchmarks. Such relative performance will occur largely as a byproduct of my focus on achieving respectable absolute returns and will occur most significantly from the positions of being long common stocks that offer super normal appreciation potential over reasonable time frames. Further he said I am much more concerned with maximizing long long-term compounded returns than maximizing the return in any given period, whether the period be a month, a quarter, or a year. My job as manager and fellow owner is to allocate the vehicle's capital to produce the highest absolute return on invested capital possible, while minimizing the risk of permanent loss of capital. 
So I think a lot of people have this maybe idea of Michael Burry in the head of the guy from The Big Short, which he of course is, uh, only he doesn't look exactly like Christian Bale. Um, but that investment in terms of buying credit default swaps on housing bonds was really unusual. By and large, Michael Burry, at least in the early days of his fund, was just long common stocks of very undervalued companies, at least in his view. And in order to execute that strategy successfully, you do really have to have a very long-term focus. Now the second thing that will really jump out to you, uh, or at least it certainly did for me when reading through these letters, is that Barry also had a lot of alignment with investors. And when I say alignment with his investors, I kind of mean it in two different ways. He had uh, a fee structure in his fund that very much incentivized uh, good performance over the long term. Uh, he wasn't getting paid management fees, for example. He didn't get paid 1% of assets under management, for example, just for breathing. And secondly, he had a very material amount of his his own money directly invested in the fund and invested in the exact same way as his partners in the Scion Value Fund. And on that topic, this is what Michael Burry had to say to his investors in his very first investor letter. He said, as you are aware, Scion Capital does not charge a quarterly asset-based fee and instead relies entirely on its performance as your manager. He then went on to add, I do not earn an income unless your annual return exceeds 6% net of expenses. And when closing out his very first letter to investors, he finished up by saying, as I write this, I personally have over $1 million invested in the fund. You should understand that this amount represents the vast majority of my net worth and the entire amount of my net worth aside from that required for daily living expenses. Barry actually then went on to kind of give an update on that statement uh, more than a couple of years later about this, you know, uh, alignment of interests and being invested alongside the other partners in the fund. He said, I continue to maintain the vast majority of my net worth and the whole of my family's investment account in the fund. And I continue to earn a paycheck only if I achieve a return on your capital in excess of the hurdle rate. My interests remain very much aligned with yours. So Burry's kind of two from two here with some of the things that I really like to see in an investment manager and you'll see in a lot of the kind of super investors that I follow here on the channel. One, they have sort of a value focused strategy and a very long term mindset uh, kind of wrapped around that core strategy. And secondly, they have very, very strong alignment with the investors and their fund. Now the third and final thing from the letters that I want to cover in this video is a few different kind of accounting topics that Barry touches on. Uh, one of them is rather complex around the issuance of stock options and it's quite a lot of uh, detail Barry goes into so I won't cover that in this video. If you want to check that out uh, please read the letters, I will leave that linked uh, in the description. But Barry does talk about uh, kind of an adjacent topic which is to do with issuing shares and also uh, doing share buybacks and some of the conditions around that and some of the things that investors should focus on when companies are sort of making adjustments to their share capital. This does tie in quite nicely to the slightly more complex uh, stock-based compensation and options discussion that Barry has in some of his earlier letters, but this is what he had to say on the stock issuance and stock buyback topic. To the extent the company is issuing stock at prices in excess of intrinsic value and in numbers and dollar volume in excess of any buyback, the company is creating a incremental intrinsic value per share. To illustrate, when an employee exercises an option to buy stock at $15, the company issues stock at that $15 price and hence receives $15 cash. At the same time, assume the intrinsic value is $10 per share. Intrinsic value is thus created at a rate of $5 per share issued. Note that it does not matter if the market is currently valuing the stock at $20 per share. Intrinsic value is created when shares are issued at a price per share in excess of the intrinsic value per share. Indeed, one could argue that for companies that issued and had exercised many options with high strike prices, value was created on a per share basis, even though the shares were being issued to employees at seemingly low prices at the time, and even though the even greater value creation that could be realized by issuing stock at much higher prevailing market prices is ignored. Here, quote high and quote low are defined relative to intrinsic value per share, not relative to prevailing share price. 
Now, I find this really interesting. We always hear value investors talk about the power of share buybacks. We don't often hear value investors uh, talk about some of the benefits of issuing stock when their stock price is really high and particularly overvalued. And although with a bit of sitting and thinking, I'm sure I could have got my head around that concept uh, relatively easily, uh, I've never really put a whole lot of time into thinking about super overvalued companies, you know, creating intrinsic value from expanding their share count. And in more recent times, this is actually something that Michael Burry has uh, insisted that Tesla should do when their stock price, um, particularly a year or so ago, was very, very high in relation to at least current earnings and current sales and so on. Uh, he was kind of recommending Tesla should issue a bunch of stock, raise a bunch of money, and that would really uh, give them an exceptionally strong balance sheet to ensure they have the capital to not only survive, but also thrive and potentially outcompete a lot of other similar businesses. To sum up his thoughts on stock-based compensation, options, share issuance, and share buybacks, uh, he went on to say, when evaluating an options compensation program, one must weigh the net value creation from A, the issuance of excess options related stock at prices higher than intrinsic value, and B, the tax benefit associated with the program against the net value destruction from A, buying stock at market prices higher than the intrinsic value, and B, issuing option related stock at prices lower than intrinsic value. So those are a few more lessons from Burry's early letters to investors and some of the things that I really enjoyed reading about from Michael Burry. Uh, I really first heard about Burry from watching The Big Short and uh, really thought he was more of a macro kind of investor that made these bold predictions about broad economic topics. So it's been really refreshing to go back and read some of his earlier letters to investors and see that you know he really invests in a way that's quite similar to what I kind of try and do personally. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this short little mini series on some of the lessons from an early Michael Burry. If you did, uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.